Um, thanks for that. I, I sent what I thought was actually kind of a dour picture uh, when Laura and Andrew asked me for a picture for the photo. But uh, after reflection, I realized it was uh, pretty apropos to the kind of experience I had in the field and the experience I had with um, my interlocutors. So um, if you can see the clarity, it's hard for me to tell what's coming through on your screen, but it's actually not a late night shot, but an early morning shot of a couple of buses um, owned by the company GTP on which I did have, I've been working with for uh, about 20 years. Uh, most of this research was done up until 2012, 2015. And the project I'm gonna talk about today um, was mostly concentrated in 2009. Um, but some of the things I wanna um, get at are um, the complexity of, of uh, resettlement of migrants or settlement of migrants in, in, um, in Italy. And so I've started out with a quote here from uh, Benjamin um, to have us think a little bit about the crowd. And I, I honestly did not realize there would be a riot in January <laughs> to have us think about collective um, issues. So um, it, it was a, a different kind of crowd than I'm gonna be talking about today, um, but certainly it fits quite nicely into some of the early theoretical work that was being done in the social sciences. So uh, I might um, speak a little bit to that as I'm going through my slides. <clears throat> I'm allowed to go through my slides here. Yeah, I, I'm not sure the, the degree to which uh, you are all familiar with Italy, um, and so I'm going to provide you with a, a little bit of basic information. Um, some of it may be obvious, but I think it's pretty important to give you the context of uh, where my research is working uh, is developing. So, as Kim said, my research was originally on Italians in Canada, and one of the things that was pretty obvious to me in that research was how central to their identity formation and their transgenerational practices were ongoing connections into Italy. And so while I was doing that research, I began to take trips to Italy, both to follow those back there, but also then to see what was happening to Italy in the 1990s, which was the decade of massive transformation of Italy becoming a, um, a immigrant receiving country as opposed to an immigrant sending country. Actually, the date was 86, but the 90s really opens up those issues. And so much of the time I spent was while I was following Italians back to Italy um, and starting to think about a new project in Italy, much of the time I spent was in southern Italy and mostly around um, the city of Naples, which um, many of you will know, and I'll give you a couple of iconic and stereotypical photos in a, um, in a second, but it's the largest southern Italian town and a, a very important um, destination point for migrants, both um, those with documents and those without documents. It has a huge port, uh, quite an important port in, in, the, in the Southern Mediterranean. Um, and it's a transshipment point for all kinds of movement. There's also an enormous informal underground economy, which creates lots of opportunities, not only for migrants, but uh, for Neapolitans, uh, Neapolitans themselves. And so these two maps here give you a sense of um, its location. I'm actually way up north at the moment, up in Trentino Alto Adige, above Verona. Um, and uh, quite a different space. And uh, although there are plenty of Neapolitans who had to migrate up here to find work because there's not much down in, in the Neapolitan site. Uh, the other map, of course, is Campania, which is the uh, region in which Naples is situated. Uh, and I'll give you a more specific map to show the kind of pathway that I was following in this mobile, um, mobile ethnography. Um, I think those, um, that image should be coming out relatively clearly, but you can see one of the the charms of Naples is the is the bay itself. Its geographic space is quite is quite stunning. And here's here's the example of it. <laughs> uh, you're looking out over the bay uh, out over the bay of uh, Naples. I think this is from Villa Floridiana. I'm not exactly sure now that I'm saying it might be from San Martino. Uh, and you're seeing um, Mount Vesuvius and a bit of both the industrial harbor and the passenger harbor that's uh, uh, down below there. The streets of Naples are different than, than that um, iconic view. Um, uh, they're much more, they're incredibly dense. They're uh, incredibly haphazard. Um, it's like no other city in Italy aside from perhaps Palermo um, with the energy and density of population. Uh, and one of the reasons it attracted me as a field site was that it was um, a city encumbered by a, a, a range of issues quite apart from migration, issues that uh, um, affected the, the hosting of the settled, settled population and not just simply those uh, who might be moving through or in there to achieve their own migration trajectories somewhere else. 
Um, but I think it's kind of important. And most people, when they go to Naples, don't spend much time. They go to Naples and then they go, they get on a, um, either a, a ferry or a, um, a train and go down to Sorrento, or they'll go out to see Pompeii. And most of the guidebooks tell you, you don't want to stay in Naples, which I think for any of you who've been there, I think as anthropologists, you would probably realize that that is a, a tragedy. And just as normal people, it's a tragedy to bypass the, bypass the city. Um, here's another shot of the industrial, um, the industrial harbor for you, um, which is, um, uh, as I said, the largest in, in one of the largest in the southern, um, in, it's the largest in southern Italy and one of the largest in the southern Mediterranean. There's also a NATO base um, not too far away, although you don't really see the presence of the US of the um, military that often except on weekends. I should tell you, while I've been doing field work, I have been identified as either CIA or US Special Forces, but I can't quite figure that out um, other than I speak English <laughs> um, and I have short hair <laughs> or no hair at all. But I've always, I think we've all have these stories of field work of the way in which you get identified. Um, and I guess perhaps also my, my um, unusual status uh, in areas that most often people aren't, um, aren't going. Other iconic aspects here of Naples you are certainly aware of. Um, and most tragically, of course, is Maradona uh, and his passing and what that means for the popular culture of Naples. Although I hear they're renaming or they have renamed Sao Paulo soccer stadium after him. Uh, the pizza, uh, the margarita, which is the most famous. Uh, then uh, Puccinella, who's this tragic figure um, in um, Neapolitan folklore, um, who's constantly scheming uh, ways to um, rip off other people, <laughs> but lives the good life. And then the bottom photo for you is, is nicely converges two issues that Naples has faced uh, in, a, in the years I've been covering it. Um, that's the arrival of migrants who, uh, street traders and a, a, an incredible garbage crisis an inability to control its, um, its uh, environment and the, um, uh, the impact that has on, on the livability of the city and the surrounding areas. And I should say this photo is actually from Naples itself, but the area which um, I, um, I follow on in this mobile ethnography is an area that has um, uh, garbage strewn across the road in all over the place. Uh, and that's not unusual in the periphery of in the periphery of Naples. And in fact, on one return trip from doing this field work, we were in one of the buses and I saw a, a, uh, a truck back up on the median and just dump its stuff and drive off. So I mean, the, the, the brazenness of the way in which the population sometimes disposes of its rubbish is pretty shocking for a Torontonian, I guess. And so the, the transformation of Naples uh, towards uh, to a city that has uh, the presence of a large number of immigrants really begins in the 1990s and then takes off dramatically in the 2000s. Uh, so I think you could sort of mark 2003. Uh, 2001 is gradually happening, 2003, 2004. Um, you see a dramatic in, uh, incline and it goes straight up and continues to, continues to rise. One of the reasons for that is the, um, is the large underground economy and how that underground economy creates opportunities both for Neapolitans but for migrants without documents. Uh, and, my, and it's not simply those without documents, it's migrants who, um, as they articulated for me, are tired of the rigid rules of Northern Italy or Northern Europe and need a place to recover. So there's a very nice play on stereotypes, <laughs> reverse sorts of stereotypes about different parts of, um, different parts of, wor parts of the world as you talk to uh, many of the migrants who see Naples as a, as ironically, given the difficulty of life there, as a place to rest and recover as they think about their future migration trajectories. Uh, just a few comments on these photos for you here. Um, the photo in the bottom right is actually off Piazza Garibaldi, which is the main train station and is a massive area for both immigrant present, but presence, but also trans, trans movement. It's a train station and then bus stations out in front. So you have a, a huge flow of people through there and here people are setting up, a couple of people are setting up their makeshift stands of um, uh, looks like CDs and foam parts. The other one I always loved is this uh, photograph on the top right, which is um, street sellers who have their bags wrapped up because they have, aren't putting them down on the sidewalks because the municipal police officer is there and it's illegal to do so. So they'll wait for him to finish his coffee and then 
and then they'll put it down and they will and he'll come back and don't in about an hour and they'll pick it up and he'll have his coffee and they'll it's a it's a game of cat and mouse that you see every day okay so let me tell you um a little bit about well before i tell you a little bit about this project um i want to provide you with two different i'm going to read two different um um doc um uh, small phrases i guess um and juxtapose them if you will but um in the meantime you what you are looking at is uh, the kind of bus that I was on uh, doing that mobile ethnography and actually the green line um, more or less there are a couple of different routes um, but more or less indicates one of the routes that, that, um, that um, would be part of what I would take um, each morning or each evening as we were um, uh, conducting this project up the this is the Domitian literal so this is actually north of um, north of Naples and it's an area of both, uh, well, it's an area actually where the Napoli soccer team has its uh, practice fields and there's some very high end expensive parts to it, um, has lots of Greek and Roman ruins, but it also has enormous amount of dilapidated housing, um, shoddy housing, um, organized crime was very aggressive in building housing without permits, which after something like 25 years of court cases, some of it is now being demolished. Um, it's a place with a Casalesi crime family of the Camorra. You can see Casal Principe up at the top um, is dominant and hides out. And so every so often uh, the central government will send in the military to have a show of force about controlling their territory. And it's within this context that it also has a very large settlement of migrants from mostly from sub-Saharan Africa, although there are um, migrants from Eastern Europe uh, Poland, Ukraine, Moldova, uh, Romania, um, uh, up and down this literal because the housing is cheap and there's this transit possibility, not only of a bus line, which I'll be talking about, but there's a train station or, um, that gets you into another part of Naples so you can combine um, buses and buses and trains. But I have turned now to a couple of texts I, I, wanna, I wanna read. And the first one is from Benjamin in, a, in his arcades project. Um, on the omnibuses, the driver stops and you mount the few steps of the convenient little staircase and look about for a place in the car where benches extend lengthwise on the right and the left with room for up to 16 people. You've hardly set foot in the car when it starts rolling again. The conductor has once more pulled the cord and with a quick movement that causes all hell to sound, he advances the needle on, tra on a transparent dial to indicate that another person has entered. By this means, they keep track of receipts. Now that the car is moving, you reach calmly into your wallet and pay the fare. If you happen to be sitting reasonably far from the conductor, the money travels from hand to hand among the passengers. The well-dressed lady takes it from the working man in the blue jacket and passes it on. This is all accomplished easily in routine fashion and without any bother. When someone is to exit, the conductor pulls the cord again and brings the car to the halt. Uh, so that's from, uh, that's actually from a piece in arcades uh, in um, in the uh, arcades project that is a quote from something from 1840s um, uh, an 1840s uh, book published in Berlin uh, a breath about um, Paris. Uh, field note: October 11th, 6:30 a.m. The crush of, the crush of people at the bus stop at Villaggio Coppola makes it a bit of a challenge for the eight of us to board the bus heading south to Villa Laterno train station. Umaru and I just managed to squeeze in the back door before the driver closes them. I'm worried about my blue bib is, that my blue bib is stuck, but who cares, I guess, I made it in. We'll descend on the next stop and I can't move anyway. My body is jammed against the glass in the door's entrance. Trying not to throw elbows here wouldn't be the best message for Caritas or the transit company. Seeing our official blue bibs, the riders around us gave us apprehensive looks. Some feigning to reach for tickets, but with the press of bodies unable to reach their back pockets. Others passing their worn tickets to a pair of Moldovan women standing near the ticket machine who dutifully enter them with a smile before passing them back. We hear the steady bleat of the stamp it produces to validate them. Our training was not about compli forcing compliance, but rather sociability. But why would the passengers know that? At this time of the morning, the bus is mostly filled with young men from Sub-Saharan Africa and then fewer women from Eastern Europe. Um, the mood is subdued. Most people stare in silence out of the window or fix their gaze slightly askance to avoid eye contact. I hear mostly mumbled conversations in French 
or Ghanaian or Nigerian accented English. And so, um, as you can see, uh, <laughs> a different experience with um, paying your fare and legitimating your um, presence on the uh, on the bus between Paris and and uh, and Naples. Um, one of the one of the reasons I turned to um, this project was thinking a little bit about the way in which the bus created um, a space of predictability, but also a space of um, uncertainty. And the opportunity arose for me um, in my conversations with Caritas uh, Naples uh, to engage with this project. And they were uh, very kind to allow me to uh, join them as one of their um, intercultural medi mediators. So when I talk about the blue bib, we wore these specific blue bibs that identified us which interestingly, although they did say we were mediators, because they were blue bibs, they actually would have been identifying us as in, uh, ticket inspectors. And so the, the fear of, of people having their tickets checked is, was a legitimate one. Uh, and I'll, I'll relay a story to that, hopefully if I organize this talk well enough in uh, just a, a little while. Um, um, but one of the um, intriguing things for me about the bus was how, uh, how as a site for interaction, it has this restriction. It's an organized space and it's organized both in terms of time and in space. If, um, there's limited duration, there's pressure on um, social interaction of particular kinds. And of course, there's um, a long literature about the effects of mass transportation on our, on our um, sociality and sociability and the studied ways in which we um, uh, attempt to um, be comfortable in the, in the presence of intimacy. Right, the crush of bodies, the awkwardness of smells, the uh, awkwardness of elbows, <laughs> um, as I was uh, pointing out, and um, and so the the bus creates this opportunity for both order and disorder, or order and um, the possibility of uncertainty, and this is particularly the case, uh, or this seemed to me to be particularly the case um, with this um, project that I'll talk about in a second. I, I just want to. Uh, also mentioned this, um, one of the things about um, the bus is it, it made me think, um, I've always been charmed by um, Moss's piece on techniques of the body. And it makes me think about uh, the kind of um, everyday kind of series of actions that we do unthinkingly, uh, uh, that become almost, uh, almost habitual. And part of the process of getting on a bus, that habitual action, we know what we're supposed to do. Uh, and actually, the some of the early material written about um, mass transit in the uh, 19th century was all about training populations to use buses properly, uh, training them to use their seats, training them to know how to pay, training them uh, how to be courteous to, to others. And this has an interesting resonance, or has a there's traces of that, um, of that training uh, in the project that um, uh, that we under that we undertook, or that I was uh, that I was involved in, um, and so um, you can see a couple. Oops, sorry, I should go back. You can see um, um, I'm hinting at a couple of things that have influenced me while I've been um, pondering this fieldwork. Um, a great deal of thought has got into trying to, to, a great deal of thought has gone into trying to think about how I could use uh, affect um, because of the way in which it operates in and through bodies as opposed to thinking about uh, emotion. And this has also had me then, and through a scholar here at uh, Trento too, become engaged with Kinetti and his work. And I'll give you a little bit of um, Kinetti in, in uh, just a moment. Um, but one of the most intriguing things about Kinetti is his, um, his affirmative, um, um, his affirmative engagement with the idea of the crowd. And um, this field work in Naples made me confront, um, uh, confront his ideas um, through the kinds of conflicts and then opportunities or potentialities that emerged on the bus. So let's get the next slide here. Okay, so a little bit about this, this, um, the, uh, the project was organized by this transit company, GTP, because it was having uh, serious issues around what they labeled petty crime. Um, and of course, here's a photo of a broken window of a bus, which is the kind of, it's, it's maybe a little bit larger than petty crime, um, 
they were looking at a range of kinds of issues, whether it was bus drivers being beaten up, uh, passengers not being friendly with each other, or people not paying their tickets. Um, and the photo next to that actually is also a photo Villa Laterno, which is the train station that the bus, if you don't take it all the way into Naples, you can stop and take a Kumana into the north of uh, uh, northwest part of um, Naples. And it is very often a train line that is um, congested or ridden with um, delays and problems. And this photo is of, of that particular delay. Um, this region north of uh, Naples, as I was saying in my beginning, is heavily settled by um, migrants from sub-Saharan Africa. The estimations by the Combiano priests there who minister to that pump, uh, population suggest that there are uh, anywhere between 20 and 30,000 and only maybe five to 10 of them have, 10,000 have proper documentation. Of course, all these estimates are just estimates as, as and one of the things you learn doing field work in Naples is how you're never supposed to trust anything that anybody says. And then once you hear it three times, you're still not supposed to trust it. And uh, it's incredibly frustrating because as a researcher in Naples, you want to explode stereotypes and undermine the kinds of ways in which Neapolitans and Southern Italians get represented by Northern Italians and other parts of the world. But the, the complexity of um, chiaroscuro, um, light and darkness, in the way people communicate with you um, makes for incredibly exhilarating but challenging um, uh, challenging field work. And the, the power and draw of the underground economy of that area cannot be underestimated. But then uh, for anyone who's followed the politics and economics of Italy, also the tentacles of that underground economy stretching into the formal economy in other parts of Italy are quite, quite profound. So, that of course undermines the stereotype about the South. It tells you other people are involved, right? Um, and so this, re this project was established um, by the company realizing it had this problem of petty crime. It had this problem of uh, no one using their tickets and the way in which they got part of their funding was demonstrating their ridership. At the end of the year, they had to show a balance of, of a, a number of certain ridership and then that would increase their base funding. So uh, they had a kind of business purpose to uh, figure out what was going on. And they then hired the Catholic, Ser uh, Catholic Service Agency, Caritas, uh, and a, um, a on this, a nonprofit organization to help them with this problem. Um, I give the leadership a lot of credit because they didn't think of this only as a, a policing or a maintaining order issue. They realized that it was something beyond that. And Part of what's so interesting ethnographically for me about this, and I'm, I'm hoping I can get some of it, you'll get some of this from my talk, is, is how um, much of this project was based on the aspirations and hope of the management, at least in the, uh, in the bus company, to contribute to a, a, gem, uh, a generalizable hope for a better future in Naples. There's a, um, again, one of the constant refrains you hear in Naples is how dura the people are, how hard the people are, how difficult they are to change. A very sort of um, self-flagellating um, discourse in, in the city about the, the weight of history on, on Neapolitans and their inability to uh, change. Of course, there's all sorts of counter discourses to that, but um, this particular management emerged out of the hopeful political movements of the left in Naples in the 1990s and 2000s, and now with the mayor, Magistris, uh, his name I never can pronounce, Magistris, who is a very interesting combination of left and academic stuff, um, and uh, the, the hope for good governance, I guess, in a kind of general, general um, liberal um, sense of things. And so this project very much was driven by management insisting upon uh, justify, uh, not justifying, um, management insisting upon situating its transit company within a larger global understanding of uh, best practices in transit. <laughs> so it was tied in with all of the international standards uh, associated with the environment and, um, and CSR. Those were, were um, ISOs that they were interested in being acknowledged for, and their focus was outward, outward looking. And so the you know um, there's uh, there the um, the uh, entry into the EU was also a way to think about 
um, Naples uh, overcoming, at least for some of these people, Naples of overcoming its uh, its relationship, historical relationship of uh, inferiority within the within the Italian state by looking at broader both um, supranational and, and then international uh, international issues. So this project was uh, meant to get together to train a mixed group of intercultural mediators, um, mixed group being those who were working for the transit company um, and those, uh, and they were selected uh, in, a, in a, like what most happens, what I'm sure many of you have come across in your field work in what would have been an organized way, but ends up being a haphazard way in that management needs to fill, um, fill a quota of a number of people to participate in a project and in the end, they don't get, they're not able to select the ones who would be best suited for it. They select the people that they can force to do it or that are in situations where they um, need to do it. So whether it's people who are getting close to their pension or whether it was in this particular case, a combination of some who were getting close to their pension and could no longer, their stress levels would not allow them to be um, uh, drivers any further. And so they were working in the depot. And then there were the component of um, precari, um, the precariat, those young people who are not getting standard contracts, but have been hired on, on two year, this particular kind of two year contract into the management of the company. Um, and they were being told this is, this project is something good for you to learn about how to be a manager. And uh, there's an interesting piece coming out actually in, um, if it's not out already in cultural anthropology by uh, Daniela Giudici about a, um, a project in Bologna in which she talks about the precarious nature of those working with migrants. In some ways, the, there's a parallel between her case study and some of the issues I confront with these young uh, Neapolitans who have found finally a job in a corporation, uh, a very good public company, well-organized, but it's one that's only on, on a limited contract. And they're being told by management um, we're not going to teach you, well, this was their, this was what the young people's perspective was. We're not going to teach you accounting. We're not going to teach you organizational management issues. We're going to send you to the north of Naples into an area that is well known for organized crime, illegal migration, and we're going to make you stand on buses and talk to migrants. And so, as you can imagine, this created a fair bit of um, undercurrent <laughs> um, for, um, uh, for the project. The other half of those involved in this project were, um, were uh, uh, migrants selected because they had either worked in, um, uh, in projects through Caritas on issues around uh, intercultural mediation, or they were people identified as being very close to communities and being activists. So, um, one of the one one of the men I spent a lot of time with had been had organized a sit-in in the Naples uh, Cathedral, uh, protesting the lack of uh, not a sit-in actually a, um, a, an occupation of San Gennaro, which is a pretty important cathedral, um, um, because of protesting the lack of housing for uh, for migrants. And so these groups came together, trained for uh, uh, two weeks, and then were just set, told to go out on the buses and. And uh, don't um, don't tell people to pay their tickets. Talk to them and encourage them about how they should comport themselves within Italy. So a uh, an interesting um, an interesting discussion about conceptions of integration of welcoming. Uh, we had some conversations about hospitality. The word they often preferred to use was accoglienza, welcome, uh, and whether someone was accogliente or welcoming. Uh, which has a slightly um, slightly different inflection um, to it, um, but is very similar and related to uh, to hospitality. Um, and the training for this group was very much a training organized by someone who you know cites Gregory Bateson. <laughs> so it was a it was someone who was had worked in left Catholic circles in Naples and wasn't necessarily concerned about the corporation, but was concerned about opening up conversation on the buses that might, um, that might create opportunities for migrants uh, in a different kind of way um, than, than necessarily teaching them uh, how to sit on the buses or how to use their, um, how to stamp their tickets. 
So here's just a photo. Uh, of course, when you're in Naples, when you have training, you train in a, in a, in a chapel. Uh, and so this is um, one, of, one of the beautiful um, uh, chapels in the archdiocese in the center of Naples where we um, did our training. And you can see the old anthropologist in the back there and um, all of the others in the, um, others in the front. Um, so there's a real sense of, uh, like many of these training sessions, and I've been working on another chapter, particularly about the training, uh, there's a real sense of trying to create an esprit de corps. And um, Rosanna uh, Apazza, the, the woman in the front in the black, was, um, was very good at um, trying to create uh, um, interactive uh, opportunities, uh, interactive uh, role playing um, to challenge people's preconceptions. I have to say the training was very uncomfortable most of the time. It got better near the end, but it was very uncomfortable um, because of the issues around uh, inequality between those who were involved and the degree to which, uh, again, trading on stereotypes, and I'm happy to be challenged on these, but the degree to which um, Neapolitans are very comfortable in their sociability. Um, and so the um, the employees for carry to, for the employees for the bus company um, couldn't believe someone was telling them about how they should go talk to someone. Um, they said, "Just let me go out on the buses and I can talk to people." So there was a um, a lack of self reflection about the um, possibility for misunderstanding and and communication that uh, um, happened um, in these training sessions. Um, However, one of the key things that happened during these training sessions, uh, two key things, uh, events happened during these training sessions. Um, about a week before, um, about a week before we were supposed to go into the field, um, seven African migrants were gunned down in uh, Castel Volturno, which was on that map uh, I showed on the previous screen. So Castel Volturno near the top, which is one of the endpoints. Uh, were gunned down out, standing outside a store. Um, and the, uh, the stories flew fast and furious about why they were gunned down. The most obvious, um, or the easiest press reports were about Nigerian organized crime and prostitution. Uh, the, those who were gunned down uh, were expected to be gunned down because they're involved in organized crime. Now, of course, that's the first message that goes out there. And of course, once people actually did their research, that wasn't what happened uh, at all. These were all day laborers who were coming home and happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. And, um, and it, was, it turned out that the, um, those who knew the area at least expressed to me. And so when I say those who knew the area, I'm talking about African migrants who were living there and the Comboyano priests who ministered that, to them and had been there for a number of years, they said it was assigned by the Casalesi crime family to just tell um, African migrants they needed to behave themselves and assigned to the Italian government that they didn't control the, the, the area. As a result of these um, uh, shootings, the, um, the bus company hierarchy felt that it was even more urgent uh, to, to get into the field uh, and to uh, both express to African migrants, but also to other Italians and Neapolitans, the importance of um, what they would say, um, ec uh, um, accoglienza, being accogliente, um, hospitality, showing that Naples was, was greater than the violence that was happening in, um, in that area. Um, and what interestingly happens, of course, is since none of these um, people from the bus company live in that part of Naples, um, they also have, a, they also, many of them had impressions of Italians or, um, living in that area as, um, as less than perfect, <laughs> uh, whether that was just because they might be connected in some way to organized crime or whether it was just because there was a, a, a very strong sense of campanalismo, a very strong sense of loca uh, localism that people from that part north of Naples were also degenerate as compared to us south of Naples. And that kind of talk was quite clear. Um, there needed to be a, several emergency meetings with the, the, the gente, with the uh, management um, to encourage people to continue with this, uh, to continue with this, uh, with this project. Um, and so we eventually um, uh, were able to, to get on the buses. Um, 
The other thing that happened just a few days after that was that Rye TV, the, the national broadcaster, uh, happened to have a film, uh, a, a, a camera person out on the bus route and filmed several times uh, one of the company's buses going right by a bus stop while African migrants were waiting to be picked up. Um, so it completely undermined, of course, <laughs> the, the goal of the company <laughs> and, uh, and the, um, the desire of management in this project to, to humanize and to make the sense of the project being more, um, more welcome. Okay, so I said a little bit about hospitality here. I want to just um, give you a first image of a crowd. Um, this is where I had to go to get my visa um, several times in Naples. It's not a pleasant experience. It, it's improved a little bit now as they've become more attuned to cell phones, although remarkably not that much better. But they give the whole number of people the same time to show up, and then there's no there's no line, and so um, and it's a, a center that you have to to get to from all parts of the periphery. So it's a, an incredibly unwelcoming um, space. And as Mohammed said to me once, uh, which I thought was a, a terribly powerful statement, <laughs> uh, was that we're nothing but dead goats here after he was referring to both this cascading effect and then his recent experience with, uh, with the Questura in, re in renewing his documentation. Okay, so I wanna, um, I realize I'm probably going speaking um, uh, over time here, but I want to turn now to a, a, a couple of comparisons uh, for you. And one of the things that I've uh, been struggling to do to understand this field work is that experience on the bus with the crush of people each morning. And so we would get up, um, we'd take the bus up from the center of Naples up at 5.30 in the morning, get up to uh, Castel Volturno by uh, 6.15 or so, and start circulating between um, about a six kilometer area, we get on and off buses. Uh, one of the areas we stopped on her, uh, was this area in Villaggio Coppolo, that's the picture just below um, that um, unruly spaces sign. The other is a, an image of the main street that the bus goes up and down and you can see the presence of the military. I mean, the military are there for show, right? They don't have an effect on, uh, they don't have an effect on any kind of completing, um, any kind of controlling or order issue. It's very much a uh, a symbolic representation of state power in an area where they don't really seem to have much power. Or they, if you talk to Neapolitan, they have enormous power because they're connected with organized crime. So again, you have to go upon these layers upon layers and then try to determine how much you believe the person who's telling you these, these stories of um, uh, impropriety by the political class. But one of the things that I um, was particularly uh, uncomfortable with in the field work, and especially after these murders, um, and especially after some of the conversations in the field work was thinking about the representation of, of these unruly spaces. It was very clear to most people um, that the, the massacre was not performed by the Nigerian mafia, um, as they called it. Again, of course, using the Italian phrase to, to talk about Nigerian organized crime. It was pretty clear it was done by the Gazalezi family, but that didn't, um, that gets written over in the um, representation of what, uh, who lives in this area, um, and who lives in this area gets incredibly racialized as those from Sub-Saharan Africa, those without documents. And immediately after the shootings, there were a number of protests uh, that were on the uh, evening news, uh, very much protests of, um, uh, uh, protests for attention saying, you know, why are you allowing this kind of stuff to happen to us? Is it simply because we are black? Is it simply because uh, we don't have documentation? And so one of the things that plays itself out in these, in these morning rides is the, um, especially with the intercultural mediators who were Neapolitan was a great anxiety about the crowd, great anxiety about um, the assemblage of, uh, of migrants riding on the bus and how their encounters um, uh, would would play out. And much of that, of course, fit in with the most famous um, theorist of the crowd, Gustave Le Bon, whose, whose anxieties about the crowd emerges out of his anxieties about 19th century Europe. Um, although when I start thinking about um, Le Bon, I, and of course, last week reinforced it, 
Um, it was, it's pretty clear to, to historicize this, it, it does a disservice to history um, because, um, or does us, because we think so often of progress and we see so little of, uh, and I know we should be uh, undermining a, a simple notion of progress, but the idea, many of Gustav Bond's ideas play themselves out in everyday conversation today. And we see that very clearly um, in, um, in current um, activities. So I don't know how familiar you, uh, are with uh, Le Bon, but he was quite anxious about industrializing and urbanizing Europe. And uh, he had witnessed the Paris Commune in 1871. And so uh, he did not trust democratization. He did not trust crowds. Uh, he thought of them as irrational, destructive, um, uh, and, and threatening to the, the liberal subject. Uh, he didn't phrase it quite, um, quite that way. He was very much caught up in 19th century notions of biology and culture. And he had, he was, uh, what's the right word? He was, uh, uh, race was not delimited to how he would racialize those from, from the colonies or outside of Europe. Race was, um, race was also, uh, uh, racialization was also something that was located in the lower classes. He was scared of the lower classes. And in many ways, those, that kind of discourse is present, was present in this kind of field work, the anxiety about um, those uh, Neapolitans or companions who were living up in, in this region um, was quite profound on the part of those uh, involved in this project. Layered onto that, the anxiety and, and, and issues of and stereotypes about race and Africans that um, had a profound and ongoing effect on, uh, on, um, on the engagement of this group in, in the area. And so one of the things that comes out of Le Bon is a view of the crowd as always threatening as um, something that uh, is threatening both to the survival of society and threatening to um, the survival of the individual. And, um, and absolutely ethnographically, that was a way in which people engaged with their confrontation on the buses. But I, what, I found, uh, what I found intriguing was, um, was the other possibility of a crowd. And this to me is the, the work of of Canetti, some of you may be familiar with his um, work um, on the crowd. He was a very unusual um, intellectual, Nobel laureate, not a sociologist, but someone who uh, understood social life in, in profound ways. Uh, and he was very interested in the bodily effects and the power of crowds. Um, and uh, he was insistent that crowds had the possibility because of the in, uh, intensity and density of uh, physical and um, um, bodily encounters, uh, a possibility for the transformation, um, transformation of the individual and possibility for uh, equality. And so very different than Le Bon and Tard who um, would think that crowds get stirred up by a leader. And boy, does that have residence now when we think about um, all of those people from central casting last week in, <laughs> in, uh, in the US Capitol, who's <laughs> my leader told me to do it. Um, uh, Kennedy tells us, no, they don't need to have a leader. Um, and in fact, uh, um, the leader is actually not central at all. It's the body to body con uh, contact. It's the physical, physical um, compression of bodies that creates and um, that frees the individual from fear um, and generates sort of vitalist impulses. Um, uh, in crowds that um, opens up opportunities for what Robert Park, who comes from a different tradition, but Robert Park might call new social forms, right? Um, uh, brings creates opportunity for new ties uh, um, and uh, the dispensing of, of, of old ties. And one of the things um, uh, that, was, that was clear on the buses was the way in which this project encountered those double dynamics, those double ways of, of, seeing, um, of seeing the crowd. Um, I'm seeing I probably have what four or five minutes um, left to talk here. Um, so one of the uh, I'll, I'll just um, finish with uh, a couple of stories. So um, as I was saying, one of the dynamics of the bus is getting up and off the bus uh, with a group of three to four uh, intercultural mediators on a six mile kilometer stretch moving in both uh, in both directions. And in the first numbers of weeks of the project, first numbers of months of the project, we were identified as those uh, there to maintain the order and to penalize and be punitive uh, with migrants. 
as time developed, they, we became familiar faces, as you might expect. And it also became clear that there was a dynamic that was um, upending the expectations both of the company and of the, those who worked for the company in this project, in that the buses became uh, opportunities for the migrant intercultural mediators to, um, to start talking about work opportunities, access to health, um, uh, futures that migrants might think about. So conversations opened up on the bus that were not normal conversations about um, stamp your ticket, uh, this is how you uh, ride on a bus, um, this is where you're supposed to go if you need this document. They became fuller, more enriching kinds of conversations about um, um, migrant trajectories. And this was driven in many ways by um, the man, these two people you see their backs, <laughs> um, Alassane and uh, Mohammed, uh, who were, who've had our respected people in in the Cote d'Ivoire and Burkina Bay communities in, um, in Naples at the time, they now, um, uh, Umaru has moved on to other parts of Italy. Um, and they um, used that opportunity to start having conversations. This created other kinds of um, aggregations or assemblages on the buses. So uh, the, the disinterested stare, the looking askance um, gradually changed. And so if you were with a Mohammed and and Alassane, or I like to think I had some success with this too after being on the bus for six months, um, there were now groups of conversations, crowds of people that were non-threatening, that perhaps in a, in a, in a Kennedy way were um, offering opportunities for uh, different possibilities and potentialities for um, people who were riding the buses. Uh, and so a, a different kind of uh, atmosphere uh, emerged emerged on the buses. But this would also be cross-cut with um, the other ways in which uh, mobile um, ethnography and, and, the, um, and transit affects, uh, 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 has, to, has to complete its work. And so as we were doing this project, every so often um, bus inspectors would come on uh, during the line. And you could feel the electricity, to use a Kennedy phrase, you could feel the electricity through the bus both um, explode and then uh, and the kind of intensity of, um, of fear emerge with the bus uh, inspectors who, um, and I have a, a this, this made me feel quite good, of course, because I was identified at one point as, um, I was called out by the inspectors for not doing my job because I wasn't taking tickets, uh, I was talking to them. Uh, and uh, instead of doing the kind of uh, order and control that was necessary for um, for the company, and um, I should say one of the one of the charming things about this field work was they knew who I was. They knew I had an Irish last name. Uh, they knew I was a you know the story of migration to North America. Um, but when they gave me my identification card, they they cut off my Italian last name, and I was just uh, Nicholas Di Maria. Because um, they just could not, it was a sign they could not imagine anyone who was not Neapolitan doing this kind of work. I saw it as a, a, a symbolic of, of, of that effect. But when the inspectors came on, you saw all of a sudden this kind of division, this kind of um, the, the representation of this crowd of Africans, this crowd of migrants, as again in the, in the Le Bon kind of um, degenerative sense that uh, they needed to be controlled, they needed to be taught, they needed to be feared. Um, and, uh, and managed in, in, that, uh, in that context. So I realize I've gone on um, a, little bit, uh, a little bit long here. I'm, I'm always uh, reminded of um, when I have done, as I'm doing this field work of Italo Calvino's um, Invisible Cities, he has a wonderful piece about the Penates and the Alaris and the ways in which um, the Penates are, have been there for, I'm gonna get this backwards because I don't have it in front of me now, but the Penates have been there um, for a long time and are the, um, the holders and keepers of all that is good and true in the city. And the Lares are the newcomers who think the Penates are just old fashioned and don't understand anything and that they're the ones driving, um, driving the city. So um, very much this kind of dynamic um, reminded me of some of the dynamics of, of conversations about migration in the Northern Peninsula above Naples. So I think I'll stop there so I don't over, um, stay my welcome and open up for some uh, questions. Thank you very much, Nick. That was fascinating. Excellent talk. Greg, are you there to take over the Q&A? 
I am here. Um, thank you, Nick, as well. That was I really enjoyed your talk. And I know I have a lot of questions, but I'll, I'll withhold them for a minute and just say that. Um, so I'm going to try to moderate this um, through the Zoom. And um, any of you that do have questions, if you could use the, the put up your hand feature, your blue hand, and I can call on you then to bring you forth to ask your question. And if you can't do that for some reason or don't want to do that, you can also type a question in the chat um, and I can always read it out. Um, just going to try to get my screen to show as many people as I can. The hand raising uh, function, by the way, is now in reactions. If you've updated your, your version of, of Zoom, you hit the reactions thing, there's a, a it's now a little yellow hand um, mm -hmm. that says raise hand there. And if, um, or, you know, if you need the thumbs up or anything that um, signals that you'd like to talk. And if I don't see it, you can always turn your mic off and, and say something too, but. Um, Pamela, I see you have your hand up. Hi, everyone. Um, so I have very little experience doing this type of methodology, but I had a student a few years ago who um, used as her methodology becoming mobile with her disabled um, uh, study interlocutors. And she um, followed them. To, it was based in Trinidad and Tobago, and she followed them on public, uh, through public transportation, going on errands, including visiting bureaucratic offices. So I just wondered if you had any observations of that, like additional level of access, like disability access and, and these buses. Yeah, so um, they, uh, they are constantly updating their fleet. And so they do have those possibilities on a number of their um, buses, but not on all of their buses. And I'll have to say, um, I don't have, so uh, there's a whole other question about pictures and people if want can ask me about that. I don't have pictures of, of these things as much because of my own uh, ethnographic anxiety about taking photos. But the, um, I did have that one picture you may have caught of people trying to burst into the door and there's, there's um, it would not be very easy for people um, uh, who have physical challenges to ride on some of these buses. They make accommodations. I mean, there's always this contradiction. You think there's no way that someone would be able to get on this bus who um, can't enter um, um, in, a, in, a, in an everyday way, but um, Italians are incredibly generous on the other hand too. So at the same time, elbows are flying everywhere all of a sudden the seas part and, and not just Italians. I, I should be very careful about that. Um, the graciousness of um, the Sub-Saharan Africans is actually even beyond the Neapolitans. In fact, some of the times, some of my best um, ethnographic moments would be, and I'm that time post field work where you're sitting with a few people just talking about, um, talking about life <laughs> and, and the ways in which they talked about care for others was actually um, and, and, uh, inspiring for me. So it would not be an easy place, but um, it, the, certainly the company, because of its um, focus on, uh, its focus on wanting to be the best managed company in Europe uh, would be up on uh, all of the, the, the um, human rights um, issues associated with what it is to be a transit company. Um, Naples is a hard city though. I have to tell you, I, whenever I go back there and as I get older, I keep thinking, why am I so tired all the time? I mean, it's a, the air is bad, the roads wipe you out, the noise is hard, the, the, the energy is there. Um, so I'm gonna it's, it's imagine the hard city. Like there's this uh, things care or lack of care heading coming from both directions, right? You'll have bus drivers, like you said, who will make social affordances, and then you'll have bus drivers who drive right by people who, Absolutely. who Absolutely. might be too difficult to handle. But then you might also have people traveling on the bus, like you said, the seas will part if it's a woman with a baby or a pregnant woman yeah. or a disabled person. And um, Absolutely. so there's ways like, even if a bus is not accessible, it becomes accessible through those kinds of like human affordances. Like um, I'm, I'm using Ar Arsali Dokumasi's, uh, yeah. uh, the way that she talks about social affordances yeah. of disability. 
and definitely to you know to realize that I maybe I didn't make it as clear as I should have. We were this project was was running from uh, it was doing the morning rush hour and the evening rush hour, and so that those were particularly difficult times. Uh, at other times there were more spaces, but of course those are the spaces, especially given how precarious many of these people were in jobs, where they were either going to destinations in Naples to uh, undocumented work, most likely or they were going to um, uh, uh, places at the side of the road that would pick up day labor uh, and hope to be picked up for day labor, or they were, so I, so there was a picture of bags, um, they would be going to sell some, some stuff on, on streets. So the real, um, it was a pretty dense bus in the morning and in the evening. Great. There's a a question in the chat that comes from from Karen. Um, Nick, you can probably see the chat, but I'll just read it out as well, just in case some people don't have that feature open to them. But um, Karen's asking how the uh, Caritas workers deal with differing linguistic abilities among migrants. Um, are they dismissed if they don't speak Italian good enough? Are there translators? How do they engage across um, language divides? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, um, Rosanna, the the woman who Rosanna Pazza, who was the person who organized the, the those who were selected. Uh, so she, uh, I, she actually had selected other people from the bus company, but she was the one who also selected uh, all of the people who were migrants who were involved. She was very careful to make sure that they represented different linguistic groups. Um, Alassane and Mohammed, who I pointed out to, um, they come from French West Africa, so their French was uh, exceptional. And, and but they also spoke a number of um, other indigenous language from West Africa. And then of course there was, um, they could all have a smattering of English because of uh, that hegemony. Uh, and they all spoke uh, Italian, um, although many of the migrants had challenges with Italian. And then Neapolitan is something that's quite distinctive as a language, um, which added a layer of complexity. So I would say none of the Caritas workers were, uh, and there were, uh, there were also, there was a, a Rama woman. So um, she spoke a number of languages and there was a, a Palestinian um, uh, member as well, and and there was a Ukrainian member. So there was a, and he spoke Moldovan and Ukrainian and Russian. So there was a, a as well as Italian. So there was a pretty a pretty careful selection of languages uh, in that context. The Italian workers, of course, spoke mostly Italian and and Neapolitan. Um, so it, it's an insightful question because it does tell us a little bit about what the dy dynamics ended up being on the bus and, and it created certain power differentials, which I, I found intriguing um, as they move, as it moved along. Is there a, a class dynamic to the speaking Neapolitan versus Italian um, in Naples then as well? Uh, yes and no. Uh, so it, it's situational. So um, um, Neapolitans are very proud of their language in a, it, it's, and it's not a dialect, but it's a language and they'll make sure that you're aware of that. And so there, um, you know, there's, there's, there's code switching, change of registers depending on context. Um, and so, yeah. Great. Uh, we have a question from Dan. Yeah, um, this may not make much sense given the, the kind of crowded nature of the transport you've been describing, but one of the things that I'm curious about is the spatial aspect of the buses. And uh, I know in a couple of places where I do my field work in, in the Western Pacific, but uh, also in Indonesia, uh, it turns out the, there are certain kinds of uh, uh, unnamed, but, but clearly evident zones in a bus. Uh, places that are really good ones to sit in, places that are bad ones to sit in, there's strategies of dispersion or clustering. Sometimes people will save uh, places for others. Uh, sometimes people are quite uh, uh, unashamed about putting market stuff on the seat and having other people stand. Is there, how does space and etiquette work out in this? Are there, yes. is there a common code or is there, is it negotiated each time around? Well, I, I mean, I guess the issue was there wasn't in many ways a common code, um, but just the kind of um, the, the massiveness of human, humanity entering the buses almost made it impossible for any, yeah. So there was no way to, um, I mean, literally, I, there were a number of times where I thought I was going to fall out the door because as the mediators, we were the last ones in, right? Because um, we were trying to get, you know, the idea was they had to get their 
uh, to work, but then we were going to come in and then make them talk to us, right? Um, and so it was really a crush all the time. But uh, you, know, you know, one of my favorite movies from the aughts, I think it's from the aughts, is uh, Spike Lee's Get on the Bus. And to be honest with you, I couldn't stop thinking about that film when I was getting on a bus. It was just this thing going, you know, how you're in field work and sometimes something keeps rolling and rolling through your mind. And there were a, a number of times, especially in the, in the evening um, returns, where the back of the bus was, of course, like it always was in high school trips, right? It was the most fun place because it was furthest away from authority. It was where there was laughter. It was there, there was excitement. Um, but it was not... Um, in most instances, it was not exclusionary. I have to say, I'd never, uh, I mean, maybe I was that naive ethnographer who insists upon not feeling exclusion, um, but it, it, it didn't feel um, exclusionary. Um, I mean, it was helpful. We were in teams, right? So our teams were, I was with Umuru or um, Muhammad or Alassan or um, uh, a number of others. So there, there, were, there was always, I mean, then e even that dynamic was, uh, um, focused on. Uh, it was unusual at that uh, for those kinds of, they were, they were wondering about the professional relationships. Um, but I didn't come across that kind of exclusionary aspect. I will say that one of the critiques that Rosanna had of some of the um, participants from the bus company was that they had a fear of the back of the bus, that they would stay near the front at one of the ticket um, uh, machines and chat with people at the front, but they didn't engage further back. Um, yeah, where I work, that people wasn't people that was back, not always racialized, right? Sorry, I was going to say where I come from, sitting in the back, that's pickpocket territory. If you want to get your pockets picked, yeah. sit back. Um, if, second, just a small follow up on that. Have you ever looked at long haul buses? Because uh, I know in a lot of places this is a very different kind of operation. And if so, how yeah. how does it look? Yeah, no, I haven't done I haven't done that. Um, I know there's actually a lot that leave from, uh, there's some, there's actually not quite a nice ethnography actually. Um, yeah, because it's a sociologist, they don't, they don't identify the town. I don't know if that's, that's, <laughs> the, that's the divide I'm making. Um, but they, so they call it Alpine town, <laughs> but it's actually Trento. <laughs> and uh, she's followed, um, uh, I can try, try to remember the title for you all, um, but she's followed, um, uh, Ukrainian and Moldovan women on their bus returns uh, and and the precarity of some of those rides, but also the finance, the commercial transactions and the um, issues involved in hiding from certain kinds of authorities as you're as you're moving in and out of uh, the European Union. But not, I haven't done that uh, kind of work. No. Okay. Last question. I'll shut up. Do they have vendors on the buses? People get on the buses and sell things. No, well, not the, not not these. No, they they, they no, they wouldn't survive. <laughs> it's just it's just really cramped. Um, um, great, uh, Elaine, I see your hand up. Hi, Nicholas. Um, Hi. So maybe I don't know if things have changed since my experience. I I actually lived in Na in Napoli. Um, in 1997. So mm -hmm. I remember the bus buses very well because it was so distinct from <laughs> from being in Canada in high school. <laughs> but yes. I was wondering, <laughs> so I know it's, it, it, at least at that point in time, it was a very common practice to get on the bus and not pay it, particularly when it was so crowded. And a lot of the times you actually attempted to not pay. And that's commonly a Politan, at least it was com common Neapolitan practices. So I was just wondering, how much do you think, um, like, to what extent are migrants learning this practice from Neapolitans, and then that then goes against what the bus company is trying to teach them? <laughs> um, a, like, are they picking a... the things, these things up from actual Neapolitans who this is a standard practice? Well, so it's a great question, and you set me up perfectly, so I really appreciate it. <laughs> um, and I suppose that's the whole issue of ethnographic present, too. Um, uh, so there is some data on this from this project, um, and uh, anecdotal data, and also data by, so the company hired an outside research team to do some analysis as well. And um, But certainly anecdotally, and 
I say this from like, it's not just in, it's like every day for six months. Uh, every single migrant that um, I ever talked to had a ticket. Whether they stamped it was the question, right? Because you have to, you have to, uh, they have a validation process, right? But of course, you know, when an inspector comes on, you can say, oh, I couldn't reach the machine or the machine isn't working or you make any kind of excuse you can and hope that the inspector is not going to give you a fine, right? Um, every Neapolitan who ever got on the bus who didn't immediately stamp their ticket never had a ticket. And one of the running jokes in our group was actually the whole purpose of this project is for the Neapolitans, it's not for the migrants because the migrants behave themselves, the Neapolitans don't. Um, and so, yeah, that was, a, I mean, that, so I don't know whether that will change over time as they begin to observe um, local behavior, but I, you know, there's, there was a lot of, um, yeah, there was a lot of kind of, uh, uh, how would I, like Du Boisian, um, du Boisian uh, rhetoric. I mean, there's a lot of like, you're representing the race here. Um, so um, Alassane and, and Muhammad would, would get into these conversations saying, you know, uh, we're guests here and they don't treat us well right now. So don't give them any more excuses to not treat us well. And that was a very powerful message coming from them. Right? Um, I mean, Alassane is kind of a, Alassane is one of these uh, figures who uh, is from Burkina Bay. He's the eldest son of, um, of a village uh, headman. And, but he's made, chosen his life to be in Europe and in France. Um, but he also, he's appeared in a number of films in, in Italy. He's, uh, he plays um, traditional African uh, djemba music within the Neapolitan schools. Uh, he writes poetry that gets um, no, no, um, noticed. Uh, and so he's, and he's, he's well known for being, uh, for his, um, practicing animism and, and talking up um, different aspects of um, his heritage. So he's quite a, he's a known figure. Uh, and so for young African migrants who have him start talking to him, to them, they listen to what he's saying. And Muhammad, the other one I was mentioning, um, as, as my Irish ancestors would say, he's salt of the earth, right? He's, he was the one who led the, the, the sleep in of the San Gennaro, um, which you would know, right? The San Gennaro uh, Cathedral in the, in the city where the archdiocese is where, uh, to protest the lack of housing for migrants. He led strikes uh, um, for, um, led to strikes for um, uh, agricultural workers who weren't getting paid. So they have a kind of, um, they're kind of, I guess you would say organic intellectuals. So if you want to use that phrase, they're, they're people who have a lot of respect. And so when they were saying things, people were listening to what they were, what they were saying. Even if I wasn't always comfortable with that kind of language, you know, it's, you, you know, you're, you're sitting there thinking, well, you know, they don't actually have to behave themselves because the Neapolitans aren't. But of course, the larger politics of it is they did, it would have been better for them if they did behave themselves, right? Any other hands up? I'd like to ask a question. We'll see if any other hands come up as well. Um, we have a lot of them, um, so I'll try to keep it <laughs> to just one right now. Um, you touched on it a little bit in the end um, about race, and I just wanted to know a little bit more about how that plays out. I'm, I work in the Caribbean, um, as in fact worked under um, John Gaiman as a student here a long, long time ago. Um, and so it's a little, it's a little different. I know the American kind of context as well. I don't really know how. Um, the language would play out in Italy and how it would be kind of read off of people's bodies, race versus whether it's a color classification and, or not. And I guess I'm more interested in how the migrants think of it because they're coming from places where that discourse would be very different and they would probably have their own kind of sense of identity tied to an ethnic claim or a claim of, of nationality or something that then gets shifted by the kind of pervasive discourse around just sort of um, amorphous immigrants from Africa or something like that. In, in right, the... right. Um, yeah, well, of course, any conversation about race is both uh, universal and very particular. And, and then the Italian and Neapolitan one is, is encumbered um, by really particular kinds of discourses around race. Um, 
So you may probably know the Lombroso, the famous criminologist, of course, studied Southern Italians as being racially different and, and othered. And one of the, I think I mentioned earlier that I'm actually in Trento, Italy um, right now. And um, one of the striking, um, the striking things about everyday conversation here in the North is the, the degree to, the, the comfort with which uh, some Trentini will talk about Southern Italian migrants in a pejorative way that, you know, you think, oh, that would have happened in the 50s. It's still happening in, <laughs> in 2021. And sometimes in a, in a actually much more um, ferocious and vicious way than they would describe um, migrants, um, uh, migrants from Sub-Saharan Africa or from North Africa. Um, and so there's, a, so there's that ongoing uh, and, and quite live um, dynamic of North-South in, in Italy that plays itself out all the time. It just was the, it was just, it was just in the news the other day too about um, uh, the COVID lockdown uh, and the way protesters were protest protesting in Naples on the streets or, or when they started celebrating or not celebrating, um, lamenting the death of uh, Maradona and had this huge fireworks in front of Sao Paulo Stadium, you know, played on particular kinds of images of, of, um, of, of irrationality that is associated with with the language around race, when it but I mean it's I you know I don't think it's that unusual to realize that there is a global racialized hierarchy and people from sub sub sub, sub Saharan Africa get treated the worst. Um, there's just there's there's just no doubt about that. Um, the idiosyncrasies of um, both Neo both Neapolitan and and then more broadly Italian ways in which um, there's a desire for, I, I honestly, I can't, I've in my mind, I haven't been able to quite figure this out myself, um, uh, but the degree to which there is an enormous humanity that happens at an individual level confuses the discourse around race sometimes when you're observing things and you think, you know, I can't believe how racist Italians are. And then you see a kind of generosity of spirit and you think, okay, well, what's going, you know, you're trying to you're trying to play play these two things um, together, um, but then there are all kinds of other racial hierarchies at, at play. Naples is particularly interesting as a city because it has quite a wide range of people from different parts of the world, and there are very um, um, distinctive stereotypes about Sri Lankans, Filipinos, Ukrainians, um, and. Uh, and so, you know, and then North Africans get played into this, of course, too. And the legacy of colonialism tied with North Africa, Tunisia, um, and, and Libya, most obviously, um, gets a different kind of discourse. And there's a, both in the North and the South, but there's a certain kind of fear of North African males. So there's, there's less a fear of Sub-Saharan Africans. It's just a, a like a, a brutal racism uh, and, um, but with North African males, there's that stereotype of, of, of danger uh, that you sometimes come across. Um, again, these are general, generalizable um, statements. And, and Naples actually has a long history. It's actually a very old Palestinian um, community and quite well integrated Palestinian community and a very old, uh, the other group I haven't even mentioned here is the difference between East Africans and West Africans and the, the Eritrean, Ethiopian, um, ongoing connections post-colonial and neo-colonial connections there. So it is a very complicated mix there. And then, sorry, I, I'll, try, I'll stop talking, but then of course you have to throw in pop culture and you're, and I think I mentioned in something I've published, you're sitting on a bus with uh, a Nigerian and he's listening to Drake, right? And so you're having these conversations about North American pop music and you, know, you start realizing, you know, there are ways in which race and discourses around race play out uh, both partic in particular in universal ways. And you have to catch yourself, but also be open to possibilities. Yeah, fantastic. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I think we're running at, at um, running against the clock here, running out of time, but I just wanna thank you and everyone um, for their questions. And I'm gonna turn things over to um, Vanessa, who's going to, um, I think, thank you as well from the, from the students. Oh, Dr. Arnie, that was wonderful. I'd like to thank you on behalf of all the anthropology and social, sci social science students who sponsor this event through the Student Donation Fund. 
And as a token of our appreciation, we have arranged a gift certificate for the London Clay Art Center, um, which is a source of uh, clay artwork from local artists. Great, thank you.